Roger, UTR 120, we're ready for departure. UTR 120, cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff, UTR 120. Flaps retract. Speed checked, flaps retracted. What's that buffeting? Ho ho ho! What's this? What's the buffeting? Autopilot disengage. UTR120, we are falling! On the 2nd of April 2012, at 7.34am local time, UTR 120 disappears off air traffic control's radar screen. The controller at Ruskino Airport declares an emergency, just as the pilot of a departing aircraft reports seeing smoke coming from the destroyed fuselage of an ATR-72 off the upwind end of runway 21. The ATR had a total of 43 people on board, and after falling from the sky, 33 people die. It would take just days for investigators to discover the root cause of the horrific crash, but the causation factors behind it would reveal a series of gross miscommunications, as well as inadequacies within the Russian aviation industry as a whole. This is the story of UTAIR Flight 120. Captain Sergei Anson and First Officer Nikita Cheklov fly into Roskino Airport on the evening of the 1st of April 2012. They're a pair of young but bright pilots, with less than 5,000 hours between them. Their training reports with UTAIR Aviation though show consistently high marks, a sign that they're more than competent operators. They'll be overnighting after a long day of flying. 50, 40, 30, 20. Ruskino Airport serves the city of Tumen. It's one of the largest cities in the Ural region of Russia, with a population of 750,000 people. It's also home to several of Russia's oil and gas companies. UTAIR Aviation is a major operator in Ruskino Airport. Its route network scattered across Siberia. UTAIR began after the collapse of the former Soviet Union. In 2012, the airline flies to over 70 destinations with 63 aircraft, many of which are now Western manufactured rather than traditionally used Soviet models. This includes the ATR-72, which is a French-built turboprop configured to carry 64 passengers for UTAIR's Siberian operation. As the passengers filter into the terminal, the pilots pack up their flight bags and travel to the hotel. It's a dark, wintry night with overcast cloud and light showers of snow falling, conditions which will be highly pertinent to the events which will unfold the following day. After five and a half hours of rest, the crew return to the airport at 5.30 in the morning. Their first flight of the day is from Tumen to Sergen, but before they prep the aircraft for the initial leg, they first need to sign on and complete their paperwork inside the terminal. Out on the ramp, a team of ground staff are ready in several aircraft for departure, and one of their responsibilities is the de-icing of the airframes. It's critical that any ice is removed from aircraft prior to departure. It can build up and disrupt airflow over the wing, as well as increase weight and drag, all of which are detrimental to the performance of a plane, especially at takeoff. Most critically though, the ice changes the shape of the wing itself, creating a less efficient airfoil, thus resulting in the stall speed of the plane increasing, sometimes drastically. It's extremely dangerous for an aircraft to fly with a build-up of ice, thus de-icing is critical. Throughout the night at the airport, conditions for ice have been almost perfect, with the passing of a cold front, snow showers, followed by supercooled rain, have fallen, before clearing up in the early hours of the morning. 
So far, four out of the six aircraft on the ramp have been de-iced by the shift head engineer. He's now preoccupied though with the departure of a Boeing 737, and the first person to arrive at the ATR-72 Brother Yankee Zulu is an aircraft mechanic. He's joined by an avionics engineer, who removes the engine covers, and together, they complete the aircraft's visual inspection, noting that the aircraft is clear of ice. Important to appreciate here is that being a high-winged aircraft, it's impossible to evaluate the top of the ATR-72's wing from the ground. So as the two ground staff believe the aircraft is clear of ice, they don't realise that there is a significant build-up on top of the wing. We'll dive into how this significant yet basic error was allowed to happen later. But crucial now is that as the pilots arrive at the aircraft, one of them is required to complete a pre-flight walk-around. A surveillance camera shows the captain carrying out an abbreviated inspection. He hangs by the right engine for a moment before walking down the sides of the fuselage, stopping next to the left landing gear and seconds later, entering the cockpit. He too is missing the fact that there is likely ice built up on the wings. Surely he realises that with conditions through the night, the aircraft needs to be de-iced. Every other plane at the airport has done so. Again, we'll look later at the factors which contributed to the captain's decision making, but a reported conversation with the mechanic confirms to him that the plane is clear of ice. You think that the aircraft is clean? Yes, we are not going to be treated. We'll take off as it is. The phenomenon of group think is likely at play here, where as a group, the pilots and mechanics believe that the aircraft is clear of ice, further adds to the confidence of each individual that they are correct. Following this conversation, the mechanic and avionics engineer move on to the next aircraft. A still from the surveillance camera does show de-icing equipment turning up to Bravo Yankee Zulu, and at the same time, the shift head arrives to begin de-icing the neighbouring aircraft. But as he does so, the aircraft mechanic tells him that the crew have refused to be de-iced. There are several ground staff involved in the narrative here, so let's review the role of four of them. The shift head has been de-icing aircraft while also preparing a Boeing 737 for departure. The avionics engineer is performing routine ground duties along with an airframe and engines technician. Helping them is an aircraft mechanic who spoke before to the captain. The shift head is the only member of the ground staff certified for operating the de-icing equipment, but critically, this has left another string loose. The mechanic is only authorised to be working under shift head supervision. Instead, he's already played a critical role in allowing Bravo Yankee Zulu to go without being de-iced. The holes in the standard operating procedure have begun to line up, meaning the ATR-72 is about to depart with ice still on its wings. To top off the chain of events, despite putting a directive in place to de-ice all aircraft before departure on the 2nd of April, the shift head allows it to continue without intervening. The mechanic signs off the job card, confirming that Bravo Yankee Zulu, operating UTF Flight 120, is ready for takeoff. It's possible the captain is at least slightly concerned about ice on the wings, as after engine start, he directs for the first officer to turn on the aircraft's de-icing boots. And de-icing and de-icing after we taxi out. Okay. Continuous relight on. De-icing on. De-icing level on. It does not want to inflate on the ground for some reason. Yes. No, it is peeled off normally. It's inflating. The de-icing boots of the ATR-72 are located on the leading edge of the wing. They inflate to break off any ice which is formed in flight, which usually accumulates on this area of the wing. The boots are not designed to remove ice on top of the wing, as occurs on the ground. They only reach a few inches back and have no influence over the contaminants further back. The captain is likely running the boots as part of an informal procedure which crew have adopted at UTER, but the reality is, it has virtually no effect on the serious level of ice which is built up throughout the night. At 7.32am, the first officer reports ready for takeoff. Roger, UTER 
120, we're ready for departure. UTR 120, cleared for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff, UTR 120. The ATR is configured with 15 degrees of flaps, with the captain designated as pilot flying and the FO pilot monitoring. It's a normal takeoff for UTR 120 as it lifts off at 120 knots. A positive rate of climb is achieved and the captain requests for the gear up. Positive climb. Gear up, activate your damper. Okay, gear up, your damper on. The gear is up and the ATR is climbing away. Its performance, however, is degraded, the speed reducing to the minimum allowed for the current configuration. The plane banking slightly right and the captain continuously trimming the nose down. Note the white bug. Roger. 170 knots set on the ADU. Confirmed. The captain sets a higher speed in the advisory display unit. We know that the aircraft's performance is degraded due to the ice on the wings. The pilots, though, are unaware of any reason for the aircraft's sluggishness. Very soon, though, it will have a dramatic impact. Engage the autopilot. Autopilot engaged. Flaps retract. Speed checked. Flaps retracted. As the flaps are retracted, the extra lift generated by them reduces, leaving the wing at the mercy of the ice. The lift is unable to overcome the weight of the aircraft as the wing begins to stall. In the following seconds, you'll see the airframe buffeting, a sign that the stall is about to occur. The right wing will drop first, with a heavier buildup of ice on this side. What's that buffeting? Ho oh, oh, ho oh. ho! What's this? What's the buffeting? Autopilot disengage. Wait, what is this? Report to him. The bank to the right was compensated by the pilots with a full aileron deflection to the left, but they overcorrect, generating a massive bank to the left. As they try to roll back level, they stall the left wing and it drops further, leaving the aircraft spiraling out of control. Report what? Shit! Bank What's the failure? Bank I angle. didn't get it! Motherfucker! UTR120, we are falling! Amongst all those involved with the flight of UTR120, there was clearly a lack of understanding about how ice forms as well as potential impact on the safety of flight. The accident investigation, performed by Russia's Interstate Aviation Committee, found that there was a lack of training and lack of procedure in place to prevent the UTAIR flight from departing with contaminated wings. Ensuring an aircraft is clear of ice is the joint responsibility of the pilots and the ground staff. Pilots should know the dangers of ice and its effect on aircraft especially those that operate in areas of the world where it's a frequent issue, like Siberia. UTAIR did include flight under icing conditions as a part of its training curriculum for new pilots. However, it contains serious shortcomings. It explained fairly thoroughly the issue of icing in flight, where ice builds up when flying through cloud at freezing temperatures. However, the matter of ground icing was not addressed, and the fact that the plane can be contaminated even before takeoff. This partly explains the meandering walk-around and meandering attitude of the captain, who agreed not to have the aircraft de-ice, but cumulative fatigue has also been pointed to as a contributor. He only had four and a half hours sleep the night before, while the accident report found that many of the UTAIR pilots had been overworked, with scheduled days off reduced significantly, thus adding to the captain's lack of motivation to ensure that the aircraft was fully ready for flight. Ground staff were also responsible for the de-icing. However, the only person authorised to do so was the shift head engineer, who was clearly busy and leaving a significant workload to the aircraft mechanic and other ground staff. None of them, however, were trained in inspecting an aircraft for ice or de-icing, so didn't think to get a ladder to check the top of the wings. While the mechanic wasn't authorised to sign off the aircraft as airworthy, yet he did so. 
Instead of blaming individuals here, this points towards flaws in UTEH's safety system as a whole. Their ground handling management manual was not being followed, and there was not one quality control measure in place to ensure that it was, allowing just one mistake from the ground staff to become a hole in the system which led to the crash. And this mistake wasn't the only hole which occurred. Astoundingly, some of the inadequacies date all the way back to the breakup of the Soviet Union. In 1991, the Russian safety environment changed virtually overnight, leaving gaps in the regulations, especially when it came to companies operating Western aircraft. An example of this is the ATR-72 flight manual, which was written in English at what could be described as a complex level. This wouldn't usually be a problem, but the only English language course provided for pilots was found to be grossly insufficient designed mostly to allow them to communicate on the radio with rote learned phrases. Going back to the flight of UTR 120, there was a chance for the pilots to recover, even after flap retraction. However, startle effect was a cruel factor. No one expects an aircraft to begin behaving so wildly, so quickly. Despite being in a stall, they tried to pull back on the stick as the plane began to fall, probably gripped by the fear of seeing the ground rush up from beneath them. The crash of UTR 120 was clearly one which never should have happened. At a fundamental level, the errors which were made were basic. It does show, however, why aviation requires robust systems to be in place at every level, because every level has the potential to become a hole in the system which leads to an accident.